We now return for another installment of Adventures in Critiquing with Empty Brook and guest narrators Caden Monroe, Stone, Cosmo Stardust, Ellie Momelli, Weird, Dulu, and Phagost. Okay, so this Adventures in Critiquing episode is going to be a little different from the other ones we've covered for a couple of reasons. Firstly, this doesn't have to do with critique of an art piece, it's essentially critique of an opinion. Secondly, I was not the progenitor critic in this situation, it was actually my tweet being criticized, but I'm now, and was then, criticizing the criticism of that opinion. So it's a critique of a critique. Sorta. Honestly, just I wasn't sure how to categorize it. So this episode more focuses on a bad critic offering misinformed criticism and the sources they provided as a means of justifying it. And then, you know, critiquing that bad criticism. Thirdly, the subject in question flitted about responding to different comments of the same Twitter thread at different times, so while I tried my best to categorize and sort everything based on what comment chain it was a part of, some of them sort of overlap and mingle and continue where others ended or vice versa, so a few things might seem out of order based on the time codes, but this is mostly for the sake of making the threads easy to digest for those who didn't directly experience it. Fourthly, just because I'm criticizing criticism of my own tweet isn't to say that like, I'm always right, or that you can't criticize me or whatever. That's not the vibe I want to get across, and that's definitely not what I want people to take away from this. Question your idols, kids. Everybody makes mistake and can be criticized. It ain't the end of the world. But not everybody who criticizes you is actually going to be right. This just happens to be one of those situations. Because, fifthly, this is about vaccines. Yeah, the critic in question was an anti-vaxxer. Oh no, I'm sorry. Vaccine critical. And no, you cannot change my mind on this, especially if you go about it the way this guy did. If you vaccinate, great. If you don't vaccinate, great. You have your reasons for doing or not doing so, but do not shame or scare other parents for their choice. I will absolutely shame people for their choice, especially if that choice affects the well-being and health of other people. The old, the extremely young, and the immunocompromised do not get that choice. They are protected because the rest of us protect them with our immunity. Shame on those who would spread fear out of misinformation or for their own gain. Shame on those who see the rise of deadly childhood diseases that we had once beaten and scoff. Shame on those who don't vaccinate and then send their kids out to infect those who physically can't. For every child that is not vaccinated, that's an Another person in the crowd to act as a carrier for deadly diseases. That means nothing to the immune, but it would be life or death to the already sick. If they can't fight it off, that silly childhood disease can kill them. That is how diseases work. Any one of them could kill us if we didn't have an immune system to fight them off. The common fucking cold could kill an immunocompromised person. That is why we have to protect them from the drastically more serious diseases out there. Shame on anyone who would risk not only the lives of their child, but the lives of those they come into contact with. Why? Because Autism is scurry? Extra shame on you for thinking the risk of autism is worse than someone fucking dying. Oh, but you can come back from being sick. You can come back from the measles. There's no coming back from autism. Yeah, and there's also no coming back from being fucking dead. Get bent. Also, extra shame on Andrew Wakefield, the guy who birthed this nonsense. The guy who birthed this... birthed this nonsense. Also, extra shame on Andrew Wakefield, the guy who birthed this nonsense. Fuck you, past me for phrasing it that way, for falsifying studies claiming that vaccines caused autism so that he could promote a competitor to the MMR vaccine that he was invested in selling. Like, fuck right off. Are people still on about that myth? It's been dismantled and proven false so many times. Autism is like gender dysphoria. You can't just receive it from a vaccine or randomly get it. You're born with it. If anything, it's a gambit and there is not retaliated after birth. I have nothing ill against either autism or GD, but they do share common traits that are not just randomly received through ridiculous conspiracies. Thank you, Ponder, for making this statement. I think a lot of it stems from the notion of the perfect human. These people don't recognize that genes don't work like that and that there's no such thing as a perfect person. I think it stems from either ego or insecurities. For me, it stemmed from doing actual research. Most people have strong opinions without ever challenging their bias of highly complicated subjects. Vaccine critics aren't all Alex Jones nutjobs. 
Here is a start. They then linked to two websites. One was an article on National Public Radio titled, Medical Errors Are Number Three Cause of Deaths, Researchers Say. Medical errors are number three cause of U.S. death, researchers say. Medical errors rank behind heart disease and cancer as the third leading cause of death in the U.S., Johns Hopkins researchers say. A study by researchers at Johns Hopkins Medicine says medical errors should rank as the third leading cause of death in the United States, and highlights how shortcomings in tracking vital statistics may hinder research and keep the problem out of the public. And the other was a link to the questionable contribution of medical measures to the decline of morality in the United States in the 20th century from the Millbank Memorial Funds Journal, the Millbank Quarterly. The Millbank Quarterly. The questionable contribution of medical measures to the decline of morality in the United States in the 20th century. September 1977. When you click on the Millbank Memorial article and try to read it, you're presented with the option to either pay for it or read it for free online, but in reading it for free, you have to open an account. Considering this is supposed to be a scientific journal, that's kind of weird that it would either be behind a paywall or a subscription wall, but uh, side note, there's a reason for that. Yeah, I don't trust people spreading vaccine awareness that also requires me to subscribe slash set up an account and or pay for a subscription. Also, that first link has little to nothing to do with vaccines. Yeah, medical errors are a thing, but that's a wide array of things. That website has the strange aura of what most weight supplement websites in the early 2000s had. Pay to know websites are known for spreading false information and, in some cases, malicious products to help or prevent certain problems from occurring. JSTOR is used in pretty much any university. It's a massive archive for research papers of all kinds of topics. I'll summarize. The vital statistics of every industrialized nation for every infectious disease show mortality rates bottoming out well become vaccine campaigns. It may look professional, but no real research study would charge you to know more of something that dire. It's clearly a scam feeding off of people's insecurities for profit. Trust me, my personal experience with these places never trusted upon arrival. Side note returning, I discovered that wasn't the case. The reason why the site asks you to pay for the content is because it's an archive. Because this is a digital archive of a previously published article from 1977. JSTOR? You didn't link to or mention JSTOR. I responded to the links to the National Public Radio and the Millbank Memorial Fund that you did post. Why are you mentioning JSTOR now? Ah, uh, sorry. Here is the JSTOR link from the Millbank site. Morality has nothing to do with whether or not vaccines are harmful. Try again. Actually, preferably don't. You're tiresome and you suck at citing credible sources. And then I cite the abstract of the study. Legislators, practitioners, and the public may deem it heretical, but analysis of United States data shows that introduction of specific medical measures and expansion of services account for only a fraction of the decline in morality since 1900. Even acknowledging that morality and health are not synonymous, analysis of age and sex-adjusted rates still suggests important trends and generates hypotheses for informed social action. The magic of using their very sources to immediately contradict the very thing they are trying to prove. Ah, uh, a personal attack on me. A sign that you haven't done the hard work and would rather ignore the subject. I once believed in vaccines. I forced myself to do the research. It was like losing a religion. I'm not anti-vaccine. But I certainly don't put my faith in them. It's really not a personal attack, it's based on how poor your evidence has been. Would you rather I lie to you saying that your evidence is great and then contradict myself by saying that it doesn't prove anything? Plus, you're tiresome. That That's just my personal opinion. Dude, it's JSTOR. Used probably in every university as an archive for research papers. Except the thing you were citing doesn't showcase what you're claiming. It doesn't matter if it comes from a good or credible source if it's wholly unrelated to your claims. I honestly, the personal attack accusation you put in here, the information given didn't prove your point. I understand you have faith on the archive, but hate to tell you this, not every study on there is 100% factual. Official or not, misinformation can occur anywhere. Also, the topic at question doesn't have studies that are actually provable without the morality part put into question. I don't know, but that seems to put your argument into a stalemate, in my opinion. And that's the end of the first thread. On to the other one on the same tweet that he started. Yeah, I don't trust people spreading vaccine awareness that also requires me to subscribe slash set up an account and or pay for a subscription. Also, that first link has little to nothing to do with vaccines. Yeah, medical errors are a thing, but that's a wide array of things. Not to be confused with incidence rates that only measure symptoms. 
Vaccines are very successful there, but it's complicated. So complicated, I suppose, that no one has been able to definitively showcase the negative effects of a vaccine outside of the possible effects already acknowledged by medical professionals without being debunked. Hmm. Look up the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Fund set up after death and injury mainly from the DPT vaccine. Also look up the Passive Vears database. The National Vaccine Injury Compensation Fund delivers compensation to those who suffer from those possible effects already acknowledged by medical professionals. And that's the end of that thread. On to the next one. Also, extra shame on Andrew Wakefield, the guy who birthed this nonsense for falsifying studies claiming that vaccines caused autism so that he could promote a competitor to the MMR vaccine that he was invested in selling. Like, fuck right off. Actually, the vaccine critical have been around since the beginning of vaccines. Do some historical research if you have such a strong opinion. Here is some evidence that Wakefield didn't birth the nonsense. I said that he birthed the nonsense, oh my god, past me, regarding vaccines causing autism, which he did. Yeah, admittedly, I could and probably am wrong on that. However, I consider him to be a massive problem who continues to peddle dangerous falsities, including that one, especially because he's literally still doing it to this day. So I don't really care if he started it or he's just continuing it. He's still a massive problem. Obviously, people who don't know a lot about something are going to be wary of it. With the lack of easily accessible information back then, this doesn't surprise me in the slightest. It would actually surprised me a lot more if nobody questioned vaccines ever until recently. That's just not how humans work. We're practically born to be fearful of the new and unknown. Next, in response to the whole Twitter thread, Sugar Pie said this. Even if something like the chicken pox wasn't potentially lethal, I'd rather have a developmental disorder than a contract virus that would eventually lead into shingles later in life. And that's assuming vaccines even cause autism in the first place, which like you said, they don't. Wow, you would really trade two weeks of shingles pain and chicken pox for a lifelong disability. Try reading Dr. Gary Goldsman, who did the initial research on chicken pox for the CDC. He is now a critic of vaccines. You know, he's, he's evil. I, I kind of had to make him British. <laughs> Two weeks of shingles pain? Shingles can result in postherpedic neuralgia, the pain from which can last for months or years after the blisters have cleared up. I think you're also grossly misinformed on autism because it's not a disability, it's a spectrum disorder. Yeah, people on the low-functioning end of the spectrum could be considered disabled, but the low end is rare. Most people with autism function perfectly fine, and that's because autism covers a broad range of conditions, differences, capabilities, and struggles. Plus, as someone with a lifelong pain-inducing disability, yeah, I would take autism spectrum spectrum disorder over what I have to suffer on a daily basis, I wouldn't wish constant recurring pain on anyone, especially not those who should be in their golden years. Side note, I'm an autist, a high functioning one at that. This means I am closer to neurotypicals than my lower functioning counterparts. Even if my autism was caused by vaccinations, the worst thing my autism did to me was cause speech problems and social anxiety. As you can see, with proper language training, I managed to get over that hurdle in my life. And while I'm still anxious about socializing and occasionally I run into social situations I don't fully understand, I'm not suffering or dying from any diseases that could have been avoided. So yeah, autism is better than deadly illness. Because the former doesn't kill you, it can make things harder for you and those around you, but it's still possible to live a full life with it. If I had caught chicken pox, measles, etc. as a child, I would either be suffering or be dead by now. The chicken pox vaccine has made shingles far worse for those who have had chicken pox. Read Dr. Gary Goldman. He did the initial study at the LA Health Department for the CDC and saw this as the case. He later resigned and now criticizes the vaccine. Nope. And then I linked to chickenpox vaccine not responsible for rise in shingles studies say, which admittedly, maybe not the best source, but I'm kind of tired at this point. The article at one point says, the chickenpox vaccine program was introduced in 1996. So we looked at the incidence of shingles from the early 90s to 2010 and found that shingles was already increasing before the vaccine program started, said study author Dr. Craig Hales, a medical epidemiologist at the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And as immunization coverage in children reached 90%, shingles continued at the the same rate. See, while it is true that vaccines inject you with a pathogen so your immune system can make antibodies for it, it doesn't give you the illness that pathogen normally causes. 
Why? Because said pathogen is either weakened to the point of harmlessness or already dead. 39% increase remains unexplained? They're referring to how the rise in shingles, as talked about in the article, remains without an explanation because the chickenpox vaccine was ruled out. The article's in the description. WebMD isn't exactly a neutral source. My brother suffered from shingles that then turned into a rare autoimmune disease. He can't have kids because of the drugs he takes. Yeah, it's almost like medical science tends to work on eliminating things that don't cause a thing before they can determine for sure what does. And I'm sorry that happened to your brother, but that has nothing to do with vaccines. That's from his current medication. It's tricky and complicated for sure. If his daughters had chicken pox, he would have benefited from the immune boosting effects and never gotten shingles. Since they are vaccinated, they don't pass that benefit on. However, they may not have to worry about shingles later. Then that should be a good thing. It sucks for him, but because they were vaccinated, his daughters now don't have to worry as much about getting shingles in the future. Future generations benefit. I mean, geez guys, it's kind of how vaccines and not taking them work. The generation who didn't get them gets the illness and the repercussions from it later in life, but the generation that does get the vaccine reaps the benefits. Let's also not ignore the fact that this hypothetical man's daughters don't have to worry about getting shingles later in life, then their children won't have to get shingles chicken pox to give them the autoimmune boost. So no future generation would be affected, only his brother who already had the illness. Like, am I missing something here? I didn't even bother to check in with the autoimmune claim because him acknowledging that people who take the vaccine don't get chicken pox and therefore don't have to worry about shingles defeats the whole thing he's arguing about, so I don't care. Also, wait a freaking minute. This guy was going on before about how his brother developed a rare autoimmune disease from shingles, but earlier he mocked sugar pie for opting for a vaccine against shingles because it was only two weeks of pain. Like, geez, buddy, it's almost like you should have first-hand knowledge of the additional complications brought on by shingles. What are you even arguing anymore? On the opposite end, I could see it being cruel and not vaccinating your kids so that they do get chicken pox just so you can benefit from the boosting effects, thereby subjecting them to potentially getting shingles later in their own lives. Top-notch parenting there. Let me just sacrifice the comfort and wealth of my own children because it might benefit me later in life. Additionally, the long longer lasting group benefits of vaccines is herd immunity, something this guy's brother with his autoimmune disease would probably benefit from. Or not having another brother or sister and their father's life shortened? Chickenpox is far less problematic than shingles. Unfortunately, so much research is an experiment in that we don't really know or understand what the long-term effects are. Clearly, WebMD doesn't. Side tangent, did this guy just try to argue that it makes more sense to not vaccinate against the chicken pox because that means that parents can get an immune boost from their sick kids who would then go on to have shingles and need to get an immune boost from their kids, continuing the cycle perpetually? Good to know you don't care about the health of your nieces provided it might help your brother, dude. Especially given that we have modern medical treatments that could help this man that don't involve purposely ignoring the well-being of his daughters for theorized possible future benefit for him. The notion that chickenpox is far less problematic than shingles is naive. Chickenpox can be deadly, especially to the young, pregnant women, and the immunocompromised. That's why we vaccinate against it. And then I link to a site about the main symptoms of chickenpox and what can happen if it gets serious. Before the vaccine, shingles was very uncommon. Mostly only happening in elder homes where elderly didn't interact with kids. Again, would love to see where that came from, especially given that I had already provided a link that indicated that shingles had been increasing in intensity before the chickenpox vaccine was introduced to the population. Additionally, with my own limited understanding of that notion, I would argue that's because people are living longer and they're in living into an age where their immune system weakens enough for the virus to return. Yeah, he never responded to me asking where that came from. RIP. Dr. Gray Goldman, PhD from MIT, did the initial study on chickenpox and observed the increase over the study period. The reason is the elimination of wild type varicella. Chickenpox gives you the free antibody booster, protecting your immune system from shingles outbreaks. Without wild type varicella calculating in the environment, you don't benefit. This is the explanation. I would like to see who paid for the study WebMD sites. It's all a conspiracy. Turn in the freaking frogs game! Would love to see a link to something rather than having you expect me to believe you at work word. I've already stated that the research I've done has led me to where I am. If you're trying to change my opinion, you should be providing the research you think will do that. Here we are. 
and they link to a video titled Misadventures with the Chickenpox Vaccine, Gary Goldman, PhD. Now, I would have watched this entire video, but I didn't have to. I literally just had to look up this man's credentials to find that he's not a medical doctor. He has a PhD in computer science and graduated with a double major, BS engineering and BS computer science. I'm not going to trust the study of someone who's not a medical doctor. He worked for the LA Department of Health and wrote his findings for the CDC to base their decision on whether or not to approve the vaccine for widespread use. Not listening to what he says sounds like willful ignorance. From his own website. Dr. Goldman served for eight years from January 1995 until his resignation in October of 2002 as research analyst for the Varicella Active Surveillance Project in Antelope Valley in a cooperative project with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, Atlanta, GA. He developed a model that quantified the seasonal variation in chickenpox based on school enrollment, clustering, and high ambient air temperature. Additionally, he created a database and data entry programs from several hundred demographic and clinical variables pertaining to chickenpox and shingles. This included logic to detect cases duplicates important for application of capture recapture methods and link cases originating from the same household. He also supplied the initiative and background material for the proposal to add shingles to the active surveillance program. Additionally, he wrote statistical analysis to a investigate second varicella infections later published in peer-reviewed medical journal b study varicella susceptibility presented data symposium and published later outside vast c quantify transmission of varicella in households d determine chickenpox vaccine efficiency by year published later outside vas e track out breaks of chicken pox in schools. F. Perform a cost-benefit analysis of universal virtual vaccination taking into account the closely related herpes zoster epidemiology published later outside VASP. And G. Perform capture recapture to measure reporting completeness of chicken pox cases to the surveillance project published in the Journal of the American Medical Association JAMA Finally, Goldman computed both one true shingles incidence rate among children with previous histories of chicken pox and two true shingles incidence rate among vaccinated children so as to investigate trends in shingles incidence in a community under moderate to widespread varicella vaccination published later outside VASP. He created estimated patterns for contagion and outbreak and tracked those who had shingles and those who had chickenpox. Nothing in what I've read indicates that he knows what he's talking about medically, which is what I'm concerned about. Also, every time this guy mentioned Gary Goldman, he also brought up the PhD title, and that video he linked also showed off that title, almost like they were leaning on his credentials to substantiate his claim, despite that PhD not being a medical PhD. Yet it's supposed to be willful ignorance to question those credentials because they aren't actively indicative of him knowing what he's talking about. So it makes sense to question people who have been trained in medicine and know about vaccines when you have not been trained in medicine, but it doesn't make sense to question a computer scientist saying that something medical doctors have approved is actually bad does not compute, man. If you don't trust Gary Goldman, the research scientist that the CDC based their decision to approve the vaccine, then don't trust the CDC either. I'll trust medical doctors on medical things and computer scientists on computer things. Shame on those who would spread fear out of misinformation or for their own gain. Shame on those who see the rise of deadly childhood diseases that we had once beaten and scoff. Shame on those who don't vaccinate and send their kids out to infect those who physically can't. Relax. Do some more research. It's not that simple. Thanks, I have. It's what led me to this conclusion. I think this site might be super helpful. It has a lot of really good sources. And I think this would really help strengthen your argument. How do vaccines cause autism.com? They fucking don't. Read the research collected by the American Academy of Pediatrics. 
Vaccines cause adults. Ah, I love this. And that's about it. I received no further tweets from this person. I'm assuming because they recognized that they were not making any headway in changing my mind on the matter. You know, because they sucked at providing adequate resources. Oh, no, sorry. That's a personal attack. My bad. Also, I know this series is supposed to be more about the critique and the subject's response to it, but because of this particular topic at hand, I feel the need to remind you all that vaccines are important and getting vaccinated helps the community, not just yourself. We've all had a rather exhausting, terrifying, tragic year and a half, and I think we could all use some comfort in the form of herd immunity so there's one less horrible thing in the world for us to have to worry about. Protect those where you can and trust that others will protect you in turn when you cannot protect yourself. If you're concerned about vaccines, talk to your doctor. You know, an actual medical professional and not a computer scientist. Check out videos on how vaccines work and how they protect us. Inform yourself. Check the sources people provide you with. Don't trust hearsay and fear-mongering over peer-reviewed medical literature. Don't listen to people who try to make you sympathetic to their point of view by appealing to your emotions and providing you with anecdotes instead of medical facts. Researchers are notorious for wanting to prove something wrong if it is wrong, because they then get the glory of having proved it wrong, and creating experiments that can be duplicated and repeated for the sake of proving their own points. If someone is unwilling to accept or look into the potential faults of their own study, or they cannot duplicate an experiment, that's when you know to be skeptical of their claims. Don't trust people who peddle medical exceptions on the basis of trying to stand out from the crowd. If their goal is to stand out, then they're going to stand out. But that doesn't mean that they're right. Stay safe and please get vaccinated. Now, with all of that having been said, <clears throat> fan art. We'll start things off making fun of my inability to not make things difficult, lovingly illustrated by the anonymous cat. B! Draw yourself getting gold for this video. You can fuck right off of drawn enough. Ah yes, perfectly getting across my level of exhaustion. Tell me I was wrong. You can't. I'ma be real though, that would have been fun to draw. Maybe for Halloween. We'll see. Sloth Trash Panda offers up some cute chibi fun with this piece of the Octomama fiend and stem as adorable little chibis. Ponder Sprocket seemingly also squishing another octopus in the meantime. It's weird seeing stem and ponder as basically the same height, given that there's normally like six feet between them, but the cuteness is so real it's palatable. Depicted having spotted something she likes, here's Ponder Sprocket Drool by Small Supernova, a name which seems contradictory but strangely adorable in concept. The texture used for Ponder's skin and the speech bubbles has an almost wet surface sort of feel to it, which is a neat effect, and the hearts used in the highlights is one of those nice little artistic aesthetic touches we all get to appreciate in life. Everybody's getting the chibi treatment today as Vinkyo provides us with a little bee chibi making me look all adorable and shit. What is this chicanery? Look at them cute blobs little fingers and the big ol' smooshy tail suckers. Pose-wise, can also confirm that it fits. I like the choice to tone down a lot of the green into a more pastel shade, making the hair brightness pop out a tad more. Balance! Probably paired off for some fun adventure, here's Ponder and My Heartless Self by Rubysin1410, with some blue and orange contrast because we all know that looks good. Given Ponder Sprocket a slightly more rebellious look with the addition of a collar and fingerless gloves to match that new belt. Design-wise, it feels like a good option that makes these two seem a little more aesthetically connected, which I don't know if that's a good thing judging by your heartless self's face. <laughs> For some post-Pride Month Moth fun, here's The Bacon Can Be Gay by Moth Face, where Ponder has managed to find herself some rainbow bacon strips. Does that mean the bacon is rainbow flavored? Can I taste it? Even Ponder Sprocket seems like, ooh, what do we have here? <laughs> Smushing my tail and accenting my hair shine, Anger Puff has drawn myself looking on in what appears to be somewhat intrigued silence. Appropriate. You know, if you know me, that is. Also, I don't know precisely what it is, but I kind of love the exact way you did the hair on this one. The piece seems so small, but there's also like so much weight and curve on it. I love it. And we'll end off with Squish Room's dazzlingly colorful Ponder Sprocket fan art using a purple, red, and green color palette to really make her pop, because as everyone quickly figures out, my three favorite colors do not always play nice as a threesome, but they otherwise pair off pretty nicely. Substituting brown for red was an excellent choice in that regard, well done. If you like any of these pieces, please don't hesitate to send some love to the artist that I have linked down in the description for your convenience. I've also got a link to the where you can send fan art if you're so inclined, that's a thing. My links are down there, check out my editor, they're so cool, there's so many things. I'm going to bed. <laughs>